Welcome back Lifesavers for another cardiovascular video. My name is Nurse Kelly Tyrell and in today's video we are going to be covering EKGs. So if you caught my last lesson on the cardiovascular system pathophysiology, then you should have a deeper understanding of how the electrical activity moves normally throughout different nodes of the heart. Well today we're going to review the most common sinus rhythms, atrial rhythms, and ventricular rhythms that you'll need to know to help you pass your NCLEX. So first, let's review what exactly is an EKG. Well, an electrocardiogram, or EKG for short, is a painless test that's used to record the heart's electrical activity and possibly reveal issues within the heart's rhythm, such as an arrhythmia or other signs of underlying heart trouble. ECGs are projected onto a special paper known as grid paper where time is measured along the horizontal axis. So each small square on the grid paper is one millimeters in length and it represents 0.04 seconds. Each larger square is five millimeters in length and represents 0.2 seconds. So when assessing a patient's EKG, you'll wanna follow these six steps in this order. So first you'll wanna determine the pulse or the heart rate. So is the rhythm too fast or is it too slow? The heart Heart rate is measured by calculating the distance between each QRS complex. Next, I want to determine the cardiac rhythm. So is the rhythm regular or is the rhythm irregular? Then you're going to want to assess the P wave. So is the P wave present, is it absent, or is it elongated? Next, you're going to want to assess the PR interval. So is the PR interval present or is it absent? Then you're going to move on to the QRS complex. So again, is it present or absent, or is it wide, or is it regular or irregular? Finally, you're going to make a conclusion about the cardiac rhythm on the rhythm strip to determine the appropriate treatment. So let's jump into the most common sinus rhythms, and these rhythms include a normal sinus rhythm, sinus bradycardia, and sinus tachycardia. So following our six steps that I had just laid out for you, normal sinus rhythm has a rate between 60 and 100 beats per minute. So this rhythm is neither too fast and it's neither too slow. It's within that normal vital sign limit range, hence the name normal sinus rhythm. So in a normal sinus rhythm, the atrium and the ventricles beat in a very regular pattern. There is a P wave that occurs prior to every QRS complex and it is within a normal millivolt length which is less than 0.11 seconds. The peer interval which is measured from the onset of the P wave to the onset of the QRS complex is normal and it measures between 0.12 and 0.20 seconds. The QRS complex in this rhythm are uniform. They occur regularly and they measure about 0.12 0.06 to 0.12 seconds. So this rhythm is the perfect rhythm and it's the rhythm ideally you want all of your patients to be in. So this rhythm requires no intervention at all. So next let's talk about sinus bradycardia and sinus tachycardia. So with a sinus brady rhythm, it will look exactly like a normal sinus rhythm with only one exception. The heart rate or the distance between the QRS complexes will be less than 60 beats per minute. And again, you will measure that rate of the rhythm by measuring that distance in between the QRS complexes. When the rhythm on an ECG strip is regular, the heart rate is calculated by taking 300 divided by the number of small squares between the QRS complexes. So for example, if there are four small squares between a regular QRS complex, the heart rate is then 75 because you would take 300 divided by four, which equals 75. So treatment for sinus bradycardia will be dependent on the patient's overall symptoms. The patient may not have any symptoms at all, uh, therefore, you won't need to treat this type of rhythm. However, if they are symptomatic, then you can expect to find symptoms like chest pain, they may have cool and clammy skin, they may have weakness, fatigue, confusion, syncope, they may have an intolerance for exercise and may also be complaining of shortness of breath. If a patient is symptomatic, these are the immediate nursing interventions you will want to know. You'll want to assess a full set of vital signs with paying special attention to the heart rate, especially prior to administering a medication which may have an effect on the heart rate or the blood pressure. 
If the heart rate is less than 60 beats per minute, you want to notify the physician or advanced practice provider prior to administering any medications which may slow the heart rate down. You want to also immediately notify the physician or advanced practice provider if the patient experiences any type of shortness of breath, hypotension, uh, or chest pain. So the provider may order a medication called atropine, which will block the effects of the parasympathetic neurotransmitter acetylcholine on the heart, which will then lead to an increase in the heart rate. So on the contrary to sinus bradycardia, you have sinus tachycardia, which will also look exactly like a normal sinus rhythm, except the rate will be greater than 100 beats per minute. So as with sinus brady, some of these patients may be completely asymptomatic and they won't need any nursing interventions at all. However, if your patient is symptomatic, you can expect to find these symptoms. So they may be complaining of chest pain, dizziness, shortness of breath, lightheadedness, palpitations, or syncope. So if your patient is symptomatic, these are the immediate nursing interventions that you will want to know. The first one is find and treat the cause. So is this patient tachycardic from a medication? Are they really anxious? Do they just experience a lot of exercise or stress? Next, you're gonna to wanna to continue to monitor the apical heart rate and other vital signs, such as blood pressure, pulse oximetry, Next, you want to ask the patient to perform vagal maneuvers, and typically you do this by asking them to uh, bear down, kind of like they're having a bowel movement. And you also want to notify the physician since he may want to order medications like a beta blocker or calcium channel blockers or adenosine. The physician may also want to perform something called a synchronized cardioversion if the patient is really that unstable. So now let's talk about the most common atrial rhythm called atrial fibrillation or AFib or AF for short. So this is a quivering or irregular heartbeat that causes the blood to actually pool or coagulate at the bottom of the heart, leading to blood clots, stroke, heart failure, and other heart-related complications. So if you remember from my last lesson, I talked about how normally your heart contracts and relaxes with a regular beat. Well, in atrial fibrillation, the upper chambers of the heart or the atria beat irregularly and they quiver instead of beating effectively to move that blood into the ventricles. So that's why you get that clot formation. And if a clot breaks off and enters into the bloodstream and lodges in an artery leading to the brain, that's when you have a stroke. Actually about 15 to 20% of people who have strokes have this heart arrhythmia and some don't even know that they have it because they can be asymptomatic. So this clot risk is why patients with this condition are immediately put on blood thinners like heparin, Lovenox, Coumadin, or Plavix. So atrial fibrillation is characterized with a rapid atrial rate of about 350 to 400 beats per minute. And the ventricular rate can be slow, or it can be normal, or it can be fast. So the P waves in AFib are non-existent, and they are replaced instead with F waves or fibrillation waves. The peer interval is not present because there are no defined P waves, so you can't measure a peer interval if you don't have any P waves. The QRS complexes are uniform and they look alike, but they occur at irregular intervals. And the length of these QRX complexes are normal and they range anywhere from 0.6 to 0.12 seconds. So this rhythm will require either emergent or maintenance interventions depending on the symptoms of the patient. Some of the expected symptoms you may see with patients who have this type of arrhythmia will include chest tightness, palpitations, shortness of breath, dyspnea, fluttering in the chest, dizziness, confusion, or fainting, and fatigue. Treatment of AFib will vary depending on the severity of the symptoms, but generally speaking, you will want to obtain a 12-lead EKG. You'll also want to continuously monitor that apical heart rate and other vital signs, such as the blood pressure and pulse oximetry. You'll also want to make sure that you notify the physician, since he may want to order medications such as the beta blockers, and that may include metoprolol, uh, atenolol, or calcium channel blockers, like 
Cardizem, Verapamil, or he could order a cardiac glycoside like digoxin. The patient may also need a surgical intervention for potential rhythm control, such as an electrocardioversion, an ablation, or a pacemaker. You'll also want to make sure that they are on anticoagulation therapy, and they're either on Coumadin, Aspirin, Lobinox, Plavix, or Eliquis. You also want to make sure to provide fall education due to being placed on anticoagulation therapy. And cardiac enzyme monitoring of troponin and creatinine kinase is also really important. These two enzymes will measure the necrosis or tissue breakdown within the heart, and they will be elevated in the bloodstream if the heart is under any kind of distress. Lastly, let's talk about probably the most important and the most deadly arrhythmias, and these are the ventricular rhythms. So ventricular arrhythmias occur when the AV junction and the SA node fail to send their electrical impulses. So as a result of this failure, the ventricles take over the role of the heart's pacemaker. It's important to note that these cardiac arrhythmias have no atrial activity or P wave, and they also have an unusual and wide wide QRS complex that is more than the normal 0.12 seconds. The first ventricular arrhythmia we are going to talk about is ventricular tachycardia. Ventricular tachycardia occurs when no impulses come from the atria. So this life-threatening arrhythmia will quickly progress to ventricular fibrillation and then complete cardiac arrest and cardiac asystole until emergency medical care is immediately rendered. So these patients need immediate life-saving intervention. Let's talk about what this rhythm will look like on an EKG. So the cardiac rate can range from 101 to 250 beats per minute. The ventricular rhythm is regular, but the atrial rhythm cannot be distinguished, which means that there are no visible P waves. So since there are no P waves that are visible, the PR interval is not able to be measured. And lastly, the QRS complex is greater than 0.12 seconds, so that means it's going to be really, really wide. Some of the expected symptoms that a patient would experience would include hemodynamic compromise, so you'll see very labile or fluctuating blood pressures. They may also have periods of unconsciousness, experience angina chest pain, palpitations, shortness of breath, dizziness, syncope, and they'll either have no pulse at all or they'll have a really rapid, uh, thready, weak pulse. Treatment involves restoring a normal heart rate by delivering a jolt of electricity to the heart. So this may be done using a defibrillator or with a treatment called a cardioversion. Medication interventions can include administering lidocaine and amiodarone. And if your patient is in pulseless ventricular tachycardia, you will want to immediately start ACLS protocol, which includes initiating CPR and applying an AED to deliver that emergent jolt of electricity to the heart. The last ventricular arrhythmia we are going to cover is called torsades. So torsades can occur as a result of an overdose of phenothiazines, which is actually a class of antipsychotic drugs used to commonly treat schizophrenia. It can also be commonly caused by severe hypomagnesemia or hypokalemia, and it can be short-lived without any treatment, but more commonly than not, it's going to lead to ventricular fibrillation when it's not corrected and treated. So it's really important that we find the cause and we correct it as soon as we possibly can. So the classical features of torsades include having a long QT interval in addition to a downward and upward deflection of the QRS complexes that you can see on the cardiac rhythm strip. The cardiac rate can range anywhere from 150 to 250 beats per minute. The rhythm can be irregular or it can be regular. The PR interval is not measurable. The QRS complex is going to be widened with upward and downward deflections. So the easiest way to identify this rhythm on an EKG is it looks like a combination of VTAC and VFib, but it has this accordion pattern to it, meaning that the complexes go from really tall to short and then back to tall again. So that's what I mean when that upward and downward deflection pattern. 
And the main signs and symptoms that you're going to see in patients experiencing an episode of torsades is they're going to have episodes of loss of consciousness. They're going to complain of shortness of breath, chest pain, and nausea. So this arrhythmia is considered uh, very life-threatening. So treatment is going to include that initiation of CPR and ACLS protocols. You're also going to want to administer a bolus of magnesium sulfate. The patient may also undergo a cardioversion and correction of any underlying and causal factors such as the correction and electrolyte imbalances. And that concludes the end of this lesson. I hope that you found this information extremely valuable and it made you just a little more confident as you prepare to take your NCLEX. I just want to thank you so much again, Lifesavers, for tuning in today. My name is Nurse Kelly Tyrell and I help nurses feel more confident, increase their test scores, and retain what they don't remember in nursing school. If this video helped you in any way, be sure to give it a thumbs up. Also, don't forget to smash that subscribe button and click that notification bell so you don't miss out on any of my upcoming content and future videos. And why don't you go ahead and do me a favor and drop me a comment below. Just let me know where you're at with your nursing journey. I'd love to say hi and just connect with you. Also make sure you click that share icon to spread the word and encourage a fellow aspiring nurse. And last but not least, when you are ready to take your NCLEX, be sure to check out my NCLEX and Chill review where I help eliminate test anxiety and review detailed test taking strategies so you can have that unfair advantage to pass your exam on your very next attempt. Not ready to end the study sesh yet? Well, you are in luck because if you stick around, you can watch more of my videos coming at you in three, two, one. Bye, Lifesavers.